Hi, welcome to today's China Economy Lecture. Uh, we are going to begin in about a minute. We're going to give a couple seconds for people to log in at the last minute, and then we'll start our presentation. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, thank you so much to the Fairbank Center for organizing us. Um, my name is Meg Rithmeyer. I'm the F. Warren McFarland Associate Professor at Harvard Business School, where I focus on China and the Chinese economy. And I'm um, the convener of this seminar um, on the Chinese economy. Uh, we have a great guest today that I'm, I'm going to introduce momentarily, but I just want to let everyone here know that our next meeting would be April 19th, and it's at 8 p.m. Um, Boston time. We're going to have Angela Zhang from the University of Hong Kong speaking on her new book on antitrust policy in China. Our speaker today is Professor Chang Taixia, who is the Phyllis and Erwin Winkle Reed Professor of Economics at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. Uh, he's a very well-known economist who works on uh, growth and development in a variety of countries, including, of course, China, uh, where his recent work has looked at the extent of state connections in the private sector, and he's presenting a paper on that topic today. He's the recipient of an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship, an elected member of Academia Sinica, and the recipient of the Sun Yefang Research Award for Research on the Chinese Economy. So he's a trained economist, which means that he doesn't mind interruptions when he presents a paper. I'll be monitoring the Q&A. Uh, if you do have a question uh, before the conclusion of today's talk, feel free to pose it in the Q&A. And Professor Shea has given me permission to rudely interrupt him at any moment to ask for clarification or probably start an argument if it's a useful one. So please do feel free uh, to use the Q&A liberally throughout the presentation. And with that, I'll thank Professor Shea and turn it over to you. Thanks. Uh, let me just share my, uh, can you, can you see my screen? Okay, great. So um, I thought that the way that I would start is just by, so here, so let me talk back. So I gave a talk at the seminar, gosh, it must, it must have been five years ago. And there, the story that I was trying to tell is, is, is that, so maybe the way I would put it is that, there's this puzzle, at least from an, from an economist's point of view about China, which is that how can you have sustained growth over such a long period of time with what looks like such dysfunctional, in, uh, uh, dysfunctional institutions? And the story that I, I told when I was last at the seminar five years ago is that is that you have to look at what I'm going to call the informal institutions. That is, you have to go beyond what you hear people in Beijing say, what the official policy is, and you have to look at what is happening on the ground. And there, the story that we told is that the key informal institution in the 1990s and the 2000s were, were two main things. Well, one is what we call special deals that were provided by low by a local government. So, and it's 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 simple. I mean, it, it it's something that. That, that, that you can easily see if you ever spent any time on the ground that, 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 that the key thing of what local uh, governments do is that they basically spend a lot of time soliciting business and providing support for local, uh, uh, for lo local business. And, and again, it's one of these things that everybody knows is, is being done, but there isn't any official policy uh, about this. So it's not you know, there's no five-year plan. There isn't. There, there's been no statement from from the Politburo, the National People's Congress, that doesn't make any statements about this. But everybody knows that it's it's a key thing that is going on. The second part, uh, which we, which we said was important, is that it's not just the special deals, but it's also the tremendous amount of competition that you see between local governments. The story. 
I'm coming back here because I wanted to tell the story of, of how that system has evolved. And we want to tell that, that the, 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 the key mechanism that I, I wanted to show you is that this, this, this informal is the, the informal institution has become more, for lack of a better term, I'm going to say it's become more formalized. Uh, uh, it's, it's become more, more formalized in the following sense that it is now, I would say, easier to do. And the way that it takes place is that instead of soliciting support for, from, 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 from uh, somebody from the low government, what you do is that you get special deals by bringing on a connected investor into your company. So there are a couple of terms that people in China use for this. They call this, you, you want to bring in a strategic investor or you want to bring in a connected investor. So the basic idea is that you, you basically uh, essentially give a share of your equity in one of your companies to somebody that is politically connected uh, to somebody that's connected in, in the hope that this person, that, that this investor smooths the way for your business, All right? And, and, and again, I, I want to say that, that, uh, that and, and again, I think that the, uh, I will show you that I think that this has been a, a big part of what's happened in the last 20, in the last 15 or 20 years in China. But again, it's one of these things where there's been no formal policy. There's been no formal policy statement. There's been no statement by the Paul, by, by the uh, Politburo or or the National People's Congress about it, but it's. A, I, will, I will show you uh, again. I'll show you that th th this is that 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 it, it's been very very large and it's played a very big role in 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 what we've seen happen to the Chinese economy in the last uh, twenty years. Um, so the way I thought then is that I would just start by giving you some early examples of 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 this of this system. Okay, and the way I want to start is that I want to bring you back to the to the precursor of China 2025 of what people call the strategic emerging industry industrial policy that was prevalent from roughly the late 1990s and it was officially killed in 2014. And I find looking at this useful. Um, uh, when we want to think about Chinese industrial policy, because at first it was just the previous incarnation of Chinese industrial policy, but also looking at what happened, I think is very useful in understanding how the system worked. So let me for uh, just just give a quick summary of what this of what this industrial policy is. So in the same way that there were a couple of products, there were a couple of industries that, that, that are being chosen in the China, 20, uh, in the, in the China 2025, in the under the strategic and emerging industries, the government chose 14 strategic industry. And perhaps the key difference uh, then compared to now is that the way the government was gonna was was gonna promote these industries, it wasn't through lots of slush funds. Uh, what the 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 main instrument was basically uh, that they were gonna reserve these industries for state firms. Uh, that was the key. That was the key policy instrument. So these were things like um, steel, uh, steel, aluminum, cars. It's also useful to go back and look at the list when, because none of these are really the key industries in China now. So when you wanted to think about the wiseness of having somebody from the central government choose what the strategic industries are in the future. But the really interesting thing about when you go back and look at the strategic and emerging industries is that when you look at what happened, although the goal and the policy was, was that what was that these industries were to be reserved for certain state-owned firms. When you look empirically at what happened, this only happened in one industry. But if you look at 13 of the 14 strategic industry, what you saw was just massive violations of this policy, primarily from, uh, you know, from the combination of local governments and private firms that basically didn't like the fact that these industries were reserved for state-owned firms. So they found a way to get around these the 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 
the this the the, the this uh, the uh, strategic emerging industry, and I'll give you two examples of this, and and and, I'll, and and I'm picking these two because the way that it was done was and was through an early version of what I'm going to document now. The first example is what happened to the car industry. So. Um, the car industry was one of the strategic industry, and basically there in the car industry, production was reserved for, for six state-owned firms. So companies like First Auto Works, Beijing Auto, Shanghai Auto. In the late 1990s and 2000, there's, this is a, a story that I really like. Uh, there, there was this car company called Cherry, uh, called Cherry it, and it was basically operating illegally that basically it was producing cars it was basically you know its first product at the time uh, as far as its first product was a knockoff of the volkswagen jetta um it's but the main problem that it had was that it was not part of chinese industrial policy that is it it didn't have the license it didn't have the relevant license from the ndrc to make cars it had there's a really a long fascinating story about all the things that they did in order to get the license from the NDRC, none of it worked until in the early 2000s, they hit upon the strategy of going to one of the state-owned firms, Shanghai Auto, which is, if you know, if you know anything about the car industry in China, it's the largest uh, car maker in China. And the deal that they reached uh, with Shanghai Auto is that they basically gave a uh, a 20% equity stake of, of Cherry to Shanghai Auto. Uh, so in the early 2000s, um, the registration of Cherry changed such that you know, Shanghai Auto now held a 20% share of, uh, of, 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 of uh, Cherry. It was registered as a new company. And what, what, what the people at Cherry did is that they basically then with the new registration that went back to the NDRC and they lobbied again for a license to make cars. And the rough argument that they made is that, look, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, Shanghai Auto has the right to make cars. Uh, has has it's it's covered under state industrial policy. They now own twenty percent of us. We should be treated in the same way as a Shanghai Auto. N not sure exactly what was the argument that worked, but but after that they got the full license from the NDRC to to make cars, uh, and then it's gone on and and, and done uh, 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 other things uh, since, since then. And then after about two or three years. Cherry bought back its a twenty percent equity share from from S from S from S I see. So this is the early version of base of the use of strategic investor in in this case, Shanghai Auto was Cherry's strategic investor that basically and that that basically enabled them to do an end run around Chinese industrial policy. The second example is again from Chinese industrial policy, and this time from the aluminum industry. There, it was the same deal. That basically, the aluminum industry was reserved for state-owned firms, and in this case, the monopoly—it it, it, it was a true monopoly that basically only one company was allowed to make aluminum. The state-owned firm called the China Aluminum Corporation, and it wasn't just that. It, it, it wasn't that that that, that they, there was also a restriction. Uh, that that any company that that uh, that uh, produced bauxite, which is the main raw material that you need in order to make uh, that you need to make aluminum, you could only sell it to the China Aluminum Corporation. Well, it, and around the same time that Cherry was 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 doing what it was doing, there was this company um, called the East Hope Group, which at that time was primarily a, a, a distributor of uh, an of uh, animal feed. Um, and the the company was looking around for what else to what, what what else they wanted to do, and they decided to expand into aluminum. They had two problems. One is that they uh, that what uh, and both of them related to Chinese industrial policy. One is that they couldn't get the license to 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 uh, produce uh, pr to produce aluminum because a private company producing uh, aluminum was a violation of the law. Second of all, even if they wanted to do that, they couldn't get the bauxite because the companies that produce a bauxite uh, couldn't sell to them. What they did 
is that they basically went to this local government in western Henan province to the small city called San uh, to small to the small uh, city uh, called San Mincha. And uh, I don't know exactly why they went there, but my but here's my guess that a large number of the reserves of the Chinese reserves of bauxite sit in this city. So what? So they thought that the main problem, that that the main thing they needed to crack was the supply problem. So they went into the city, and they basically created a joint venture with the local government of uh, San Nisha. So they basically, uh, so their joint venture partner was a local state-owned firm called the uh, Huanghe Electricity, and they created this new company as a joint venture called East Hope, uh, called East Hope uh, Aluminum. This was around in two thousand and two. Uh, uh, to 2000. Um, um, so with this new company, they were able to basically start a, to to to, uh, to 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 uh, produce aluminum. And by 2008, uh, 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 the the state's share of the aluminum sector it was previously at 98 percent in 2002. And with the entry of the East Hope aluminum into the market. Uh, 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 East Hope captured about the 20, uh, 20 to 30 percent share of the market. Uh, the state-owned firm was is, is still the largest company, but it, it no longer had it, it no longer had a monopoly on the market. So I'm going to come back and just tell you more about these uh, about these two companies and what's what's happened to these companies since then. But what we're going to do is that we're going to just show you how these early these were early examples of what has grown tremendously since the early 2000s. So the key thing that we're going to bring to the table is that we're going to we have new data. We have administrative data on the universe of firms in China. So we see everybody. Uh, so we see everybody, uh, you know, down from the noodle shop vendor to the largest firm, uh, to the the uh, largest company in China. And I'll say more about it. We also see all the holding companies, which is going to be key. And the key thing is that we is that it is administrative data. So we all we also see the owners of every single company. So we can tell you for every single company in China, who is the ultimate owner of, of this company, okay? And once we identify the owners, what we can do then is that we can look at, well, what are the relationships between the different owners and how have the relationships changed, okay? So what we're gonna document for you is that these, the in, is that these uh, investments by special investors, by politically connected investors, the kind of thing that Cherry did, that Cherry and Shanghai Aldo did, or the kind of thing that East Hope and the Samen Shah local government did, has really has had really you know uh, ha, has really expanded dramatically in the last twenty in in the last twenty or so years. Okay. So let me just give you a quick summary of what is it that we find, and then I'll jump back and, and just and, and 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 show you more of the data, so you can get a sense of what we can measure and what we can't uh, measure. So we document four uh, uh, four key things. First of all, the first thing that you see is that there's there's been a big increase in investment by state owners in private firms, and this takes place, so there are two main margins in which this has taken place. There's what, what, what uh, using the language of economists, that there's been an increase on the extensive margin. That, that is, what fraction of state owners are doing this, okay? And that number goes up from 3% of state owners were doing this 20 years ago, and now it's 25% of state owners are, are doing this. Second, there's a conditional on doing this, there's also be an increase on what we call the, the intensive margin. So conditional on doing this, a, a, a state owner was investing in three other private firms back 20 years ago, and now that number is 15 per, it is, is about uh, 15. So there's been, so the, the, those, there's been a five-fold increase of this, of this type of activity on the intensive margin. Now, the consequence, is the product of these two things is just the increase in the number of private 
owners that have these special connections such that by 2019, we have about 100,000 private owners that have these ties with state owners. And these owners account for about 17% of all the registered capital of China. So it's, 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 it's a sizable chunk of the uh, Chinese economy. The second thing that you see is that it doesn't end there. What you see is that these, these owners that, that, that become connected to the state, become connected, what you see them do after they become uh, connected is that then they start to grow. So I'll show you some evidence of this is that so they, 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 their, their businesses grow, they expand into new businesses, they expand into new geographic locations. And the third thing that they do, which is going to be, I think, I think an important part of the story, and I think is less well known, is that these, these, these connected owners, what they also do is that they turn around and they basically do the same thing with other companies. So in a sense, they then become the godfather, if, if, you, if you like that term. Uh, so I'm going to borrow from, from Meg's recent uh, uh, paper. So they then become the godfather for other private, uh, old, uh, old, uh, the, for uh, other pri uh, 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 private owners. So that this is the key mechanism through which this, this, this network of influence spreads. It's almost like, I mean, if from an economist's point of view, you can almost model it like in the same way that you model the spread of COVID. And, and then a lot of the ad, a lot of the underlying analytics of the model is is almost exactly the model of the spread of COVID. The not sure how much how, how, how much political scientists have delved into the model, but by now every single economist have dived into the basic mechanics of of that basic uh, public health model, which is called the SRR model. And then the model that we, we, we basically adapted is almost exactly the same thing. That basically the way that the system spreads is that you know I get infected with the state owner. And then the way the system spreads is that then I go around and I infect other people. And then these people go around and infect uh, uh, other, pe uh, other, uh, other uh, people as well. And this is exactly what you see has happened. What what we see has uh, has happened. So so just in terms of the numbers, there's been a large increase in private owners that are not directly connected to the state, but they are what we call indirectly connected to the state through this network. And these the second group account for about uh, for for about nineteen percent of of uh, Chinese of all registered capital. So if you want to uh, say think about what. What's the size of the private owners that are that are connected? It's about thirty eight per. It's about thirty eight percent in the last year of the data that we have, which is two thousand and nineteen. Okay. So unless there are questions, then let me just dive into the details of what the data is, so that it's. Uh, uh, I'll just take a two second pause, see whether Meg wants to ask something. Yeah, sure. But I mean, you're, I think you're probably going to get into it. But one, okay. I mean, so one question I have is what's the time? What's the timing of a lot of this? And so, I mean, to say basically by 2019 is one thing, but we know, for example, there's a massive entry of state capital into the private sector, or into other, you know, state or non-state firms in 2015. And so what, what time period is driving the number you arrive at, which is like a total of 38%. Yeah. And then, I mean, I have a bunch of other questions too, but maybe you'll, you'll and about the logic of what this is and how we can tell why it's happening, but maybe that's better left to after the data. Yeah, if you give me, I'll, I'll get to you to the yeah. first question in, in two slides. And so, but, but first let, let me just uh, describe the, uh, let, let me uh, describe the data to you, okay? So the data that we're using for this is the China, is China's firm registry. So it's basically the administrative data uh, that in, in which uh, that contains all of the firm registration. So the, uh, registration. So the basic idea is that whenever you start, wh whenever you create a company, the first thing that you do is that you basically have to register your firm with this body called the State Administration of Industry and Commerce. We have two cross sections of this data. We 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 have the cross section in 2000 and we have the cross section in 2019. So we have all the companies 
that were operating in 2000 and in 2019. Plus, in, in both of these years, we also have all the companies that existed until that date, but, no, but are no longer operating. So it includes also, the data also includes the firms that have, uh, that, that had, that are no longer, uh, that are no longer operational. So just, just to make clear, like for, for just to make clear, the data in 2019 also can, it also contains all the companies that were operating in 2000, all right? Um, the key thing that we, that we have in the data that you can observe in the data is that you see the owners uh, because it's the registration date, okay? So we see the owners of every single company in 2019 and 2000, or at the, uh, or if the company is longer, no longer operational, and they're the owners as of the exit. Okay. And when you look at the owners, it's useful to just understand a little bit about ownership in China. They're they're basically in the data. There are going to be three types of owners. Okay. There's going to be what 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 legally is called an individual owner. So think of that as a person. Okay. And, and a person is identified in this data with an anonymized personal ID. Uh, um, so that's a, the second type of owner is what is what the Chinese call a legal person. Okay, and we have the name and the ID of a legal person. So this is important. So I, I'm going to spend spend some time on it. A legal person is basically either another company, or what is also very frequent is that it's just a holding shop, right? And when you look at some of the largest companies in China, what you what you're gonna find is that most of them, in, in most of the largest companies in China, um, they are gonna be owned by a, a, by a bunch of holding shells, uh, by a bunch of legal per, uh, by a bunch of legal per. So think of this as being, yeah, it's it's just a shell company. So think of this as as companies created by the four by by the famous Fonseca law firm in the Panama, right? Uh, the the law firm behind the pa, uh, the uh, behind the Panama Papers. The last group of owners is what is called a collective, and the collective is basically the publicly traded shares of a company that obviously is uh, publicly traded. So we have the equity share um, uh, of each of each uh, owner, and this is what's important. Okay, so, and, and I'll just say this for the, I mean, Meg knows this well, but for any of you who've ever looked at, 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 at the large Chinese businesses, the first thing that is going to be clear is that it is very difficult to figure out who the owners are. And the reason it's difficult to figure out who the owners are is because when, when you look at who, uh, when you look at who they're, uh, who, who on paper is the owner of the company, it's a bunch of holding shots. Right, it's just a bunch of whole holding shells. So again, think about the Fonseca law. But this is what's what what is really important. What what you can do with, with this data that if it's a Chinese holding shell, okay, the Chinese holding shells also have to be registered. So a Chinese holding shell is also somewhere in this data. So what you can do then is that you know for when you look at a large company, at a typical large company, it's owned by 20 holding shells. And most of the time, you know, at least for, you know, if you're doing this in the US, you come up with, you know, three companies in the Bahamas, three in Delaware. There's nothing that you can do because it's all hidden behind law firms. But in China, what you can do is that if it's a Chinese holding shell, you can basically look for that holding shell in the data and look at who the owners of the holding shell are. Right, and what you're gonna find, uh, what you're gonna find is that in the majority of the cases, the holding shells themselves are owned by a bunch of other holding shells. So, and then you look at these holding shells; they're owned by other whole, by a bunch of other holding shells as well. So, the ownership structure is very, it's like it's like this Russian doll, right? But again, you know, we w once you have all the data, and you have infinite patience with your computer. What you can do is that you 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 can just write a program and just get and, and, and you can write a program and you can just keep on going until it finally stops, until you finally get to an individual person, a state-owned firm. So that's what we, we essentially do. We basically use data and we basically penetrate 
the holding shell structure. And we basically identify for every single company who is the ultimate owner of the company, not the immediate owner, but the ultimate owner of, of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the company. One important caveat, okay? If it's a Chinese holding shell, we, we can find it, okay? But if it's a foreign hold, if it's a foreign holding shell, a foreign holding shell is not in the data. So if it literally happens to be the Fonseca law, law firm, then we know nothing, right? So then we, or if it's a collective owner, if it's the publicly held shares, we also know nothing. Like this, we don't know who the shareholders are. It just tells you that there's this, that there's this collective share that owns 20% of the company, but we don't know who the individual own. We, and if you give me, in, in two slides, I will, three slides, I will show you, uh, you know, how much of, of the Chinese corporate structure we are able to penetrate and how much we're not, because it's going through the, 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 the part that we can't, we can't identify the owners are the parts in which it, that is owned by the for by a foreign, uh, by a foreign uh, holding shell, and, or uh, that's owned by a collective own, uh, that, uh, owned by a collective owner. Lastly, we know the year the company was established. We, if the company is no, no longer operational, we know the year that the company left. And the main limitation of the data is that we only see the registered capital of the firm. We don't have sales. We don't have. We, we don't have. We we don't have sales. We don't have employment. Uh, uh, so that's the trade-off. But we 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 have done a little bit where we where we have merge this this administrative data with the manufacturing census so at least for the manufacturing sample we we can say something about sales we can say uh something about employment but that's uh, but you know obviously i i don't think that manufacturing is where a lot of the interesting action has taken place in china so let me just give you i'll i'll come back to my two examples again and 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 again, let me just give you an illustration. Okay, so I'm going to go back to East Hope, and I'll just show you what the administrative data uh, uh, shows you about East Hope. So here, what, what I'm going to do is that I'm showing you what the administrative uh, data identifies as the owners of two of the companies in the East Hope group. So these are the companies at the bottom. Okay, so that's East Hope the East, East Hope uh, Aluminum at the bottom here. And this other company also based in the city of uh, San Mincha called San Mincha Datang Mining. Okay, when you look, so East Hope uh, Aluminum was, was their original company in, in uh, San Mincha. This was the company that basically broke uh, the China Aluminum Corporation's monopoly. When you look at in 2000, so this is the data in 2019, when you open up that data and you look at who the owners are of East Hope Aluminum, it's basically three holding shells. It's this company called the East Hope Group Limited that owns 37%. And these two other companies called Xi Debang Metal and Xi Debang Trade, uh, 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 trade, uh, uh, trade, uh, trade uh, Limited. Let's look at the East Hope Group. When you can then look in the registration data and look for the East Hope Group, and what you're going to find is they're owned by two other holding shells. One is called East Hope Enterprise Management, this gray, light gray circle here, and this uh, other company called East Hope Investment Hole, um, uh, 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 East Hope Investment Holding. East Hope didn't give us much grief, or at least this, this that uh, it didn't take us that much work because once you looked at these at the two holding shells at the top then 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 our work ends because at that point what you find is that these two holding shells are, are owned by two individuals okay and you look and then it, it's not that hard to figure out that these two is that these two individuals it's a guy called Liu Yongxing who was the founder of the ESO group and this other a uh, person who, you know, after some Googling, you, you can easily figure out that it's a son, right? So it's, so let, let so let, let me just say that East Hope Aluminum is a hundred, is fully, uh, and let, let me just say one last thing, okay? The, there, the other part of East Hope Aluminum is owned by these two companies called Xi Debang. These are 
also holding companies, but they're not in the data because they are they are holding companies that were registered in Hong Kong. Uh, so they're not in the data. So we searched a little bit in the Hong Kong registration data. We, we were able to find out that these two hold these two holding companies are also owned by the two Leos. Uh, uh, so in this case, it, uh, it wasn't hard to figure out that the East Hope Aluminum is 100% owned by the Liu family, right? Through this structure of uh, through the structure of a whole the structure of holding shells. Let me just quickly go through the other company. There's this other company called Samensha Datang Mining. It's 13% of them is owned by this other company called, uh, called uh, Mianchi Mining. Um, I, I should have said it, the colors in this circle are indicate our, our guesses of what type of company it is. If it's a dark gray, that is that we are uh, that that's our sign that these are real companies. If it's a light gray, then the, there it's a holding shell. A blue means that it's a person, and red means that it's a state-owned firm, right? That that's what. The, so Mianchi Mining is a real company, and you look at Mianchi uh, Mining; they're owned by two other holding shells, and it happens to be the case that two of the holding shells are exactly the same holding shells that also own East Hope, uh, that, that also own uh, East Hope uh, Lumina. Um, so the Liu family, through this, through these holding shells and through this real company, Mianqing uh, uh, Mining, owns something like a point, uh, it, it owns something like a 13% share of Samicha Datang Mining. The other 13% is owned by this other company called Samencha Jijiang Mining, and that's another complicated company. That's a quasi, mostly a private conglomerate. That's a mining conglomerate that's based somewhere else. And mo the majority of the company, 75% of the company, are owned by five state-owned firms that are locally owned, that are owned by the local government. So this is just to give you an illustration of what the typical company looks like, uh, the, the typical large uh, 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 company that looks like. It can get a lot more complicated than this. It, it, it can get uh, a lot more complicated than this, but I would say that this is more typical, uh, that, 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 that two or three layers is, is uh, in terms of the owner. And I think there's just this fascinating work to be done at trying to understand what is it that's accounting for these multiple layers what is it that they're that these owners are trying to uh are are, are trying to uh, accomplish with that being said let me say that that's not what we do here what we're going to do is that we're going to treat all that as a nuisance and we are just going to we are going to we're going to we are going to uh, ignore all these layers and we are going to focus on the owner, the ultimate o, uh, the ultimate owner of of every firm. That is, we are not going to focus on East Hope Investment Holdings. We're going to focus on the Liu family. Okay. So we are going to penetrate all these uh, all these holding companies, and we are going to just focus on the ultimate owners. And the second thing we're going to do is that once we've identified the ultimate owners, then we're going to focus on the links, on the equity links between the different ultimate owners. So in this case, what we're, what we're going to say is that the Liu family has an equity link, has an equity tie with, with, with uh, basically six bodies, with the five state-owned firms here and with the Samisha Jijiang mining group or whoever the owners are of that group, okay? That's where I'm gonna be. So let me now just move, just take the East Hope group and let me just move up a circle. And let me now, with now that you understand the structure, let me give you the full, uh, actually before that, uh, let, let me just show you what the data looks like. So this is the data, just the summary statistics of the data. The total number of firms that's in the first column it goes up from it goes up from about a million to 37 million, and the the the, the other columns show you 
uh, uh, the number of owners uh, in each year of in each year of the data. So you can see that the big increase is in terms of the number of of uh, individuals that 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 own some of the firms. This is the share of this is the table that shows you the share of registered capital of the different types of uh, ultimate. Um, the the uh, different type of uh, ultimate uh, owner. So the first column shows you the share of registered capital of private individuals, and this is something that is well known that the share that I mean this is basically the share of the private sector. In in this case, it's the private owner. After we trace through, uh, we've gone through these ownership there. So the first part of the uh, it, so the first column just shows you what is frequently stated, which is. You know, one way in which you can think about China is that it's the decline of the state of the state sector. You see that here, and the rise of the private, uh, the rise of, of the private sector. But what what we're going to do is to show you that it, the story it's it's not that simple. Uh, that that what I'm going to show is that the rise of the private sector is primarily driven by the rise of the connected private uh, sector, and then. The last two columns are basically the share register capital of the sector that we cannot penetrate, which is the foreign share and the collective share. That is, we don't know who, I mean, it could be the case. And I think that a lot of the foreign share really ultimately are, are, are uh, Chinese, but we just don't know that, right? Uh, we just don't know that. And then in terms of the, the, the collective sector, we also don't know who are the ultimate owners behind this, okay? So with that, uh, um, let me then um, go back to the East Hope Group, okay? So I'm gonna use these two companies a lot. So, so, I, uh, so I've told you the story of one of these companies, then I've shown you what the ownership structure looks like. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the, to the, the totality of the East Hope Group, okay? So the way I'm going to define the ESOP group, I'm going to define it as companies where the Liu families, after you penetrate this ownership layer, owns at least a 20, uh, owns at least a 10% equity share. So how many companies are these? There are 236 companies in total after you work through all the data and after you work through all these complicated ownership chains. So the 236 companies, 27 of them are joint ventures. Okay, 27 of them are, are, are joint uh, 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 ventures. And if you aggregate the Liu families, the Liu family share in all these companies, that in 2019, it aggregates up to 26 billion yen, right? So if you wanna know what's the rough size of the ESO group, it's 236 companies and the Liu family's equity uh, in these companies is about 26 uh, billion yen, right? That, 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 uh, but let me now uh, 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 let me now uh, hone in on these joint ventures. What are these joint ventures, and who are these joint ventures with? Okay, that's and that's what I, I'm going to show you in the next two columns. Okay, of the 27 joint ventures, 15 of them are with state-owned firms. Okay, what are the characteristics of these state-owned firms? Well, these state-owned firms, on average, have 600 companies. That's this number here, and they're also big, they're much bigger than the Liu family. So each state-owned firm on average, if you aggregate their equity in all these 600 companies, their equity, when if you add that up, uh, it, it's uh, 226 billion yen, okay? So one group of, of companies that the Liu family is having joint ventures with are with state-owned firms that are much larger than they are. Okay, but that's not the only thing that they're that that that's not the only thing that Liu family is doing. They also have 12 joint ventures with other private owners. Who are these other private owners? Well, if you add up their companies, their the equity of these private of the other private uh, own uh, uh, um, uh, 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 these other private owners, that is only about five billion yen, right? So only, right? Uh, uh, only. But but the first thing I want you to see is that is is that you know the Liu family has a bunch of joint ventures, and they have joint ventures with two types of owners. One are the state 
owners that are invariably much larger than the ESOP group. And they also have joint ventures with other private owners. And the other private owners that have joint ventures with are typically small. Okay. Let me now do the same thing. And let me show you the, the case of a Shanghai outer. And let me just show you what is the what is the full dimension? What, what are the full dimensions of Shanghai Auto? So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing here in, in, in this table is that I'm doing the same exercise, but now I'm focused on the state firm called Shanghai Auto. So the same thing, you know, what are the companies that are part of the Shanghai group? I'm going to, to define the group as being companies where the Shanghai Auto owns at least a 10% equity share. How many companies are these? There are 586 companies. Okay, so it's it's a big uh, so so you will be missing a big part of what is the Shanghai Auto Group if you only focus on Shanghai GM or Shanghai Volkswagen, you know, or you know the 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 the, uh, the companies that are at the front, if, if 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 you will. But what you also see in terms of in, in Shanghai Auto is that you know 360 of these companies are joint ventures with other people. Okay, and Shanghai Auto is for you know it's that they're big that that if you add up Shanghai uh, Shanghai Auto's equity in all these 586 companies, it totals 169 billion uh, yen. Okay, who are the joint venture partners? Some of the joint venture partners are other state-owned firms that are roughly of, of the same size as Shanghai Auto, and the other joint venture partners are private firms. And here I'm gonna break down the private owners into two groups, okay? The first group, which is what I show in the third column, are the own, are the joint ventures of Shanghai Auto with three companies, with, with, uh, with uh, Anbang Insurance, VW, and GM. There are 10 owners that are behind these three companies. Two of them are obviously GM in the US and VW in, in uh, 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 yeah, in uh, Germany, and there are 50, and Shanghai Auto has 57 joint ventures with, with the owners that are behind uh, Anbang, VW, and, and GM. And, and, you know, these are pretty big companies, but they are, but they, but, but they are smaller, and, or uh, the owners, the 10 owners behind Anbang, VW, and, 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 and the GM, they're smaller. Uh, their their registered capital is about, is about 11 billion yen. And lastly, the last group of private owners, um, uh, so Shanghai Auto has 157 joint ventures with 145 private uh, owners that are just tiny uh, relative to Shanghai Auto. They have a registered capital of 1.4 billion yen. All right, so let, let, let me just summarize this that, that what do we think I, 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 we take away from this? That, that there are multiple ownership links, that Shanghai Auto has investments with 155 private owners. East Hope has joint ventures with 15 state owners and 11 private, uh, 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 11, uh, private owners. The second thing is that what you also see is that there is, I think, a clear hierarchy of owners. That they're the largest owners in, in, in the two cases I gave you. The largest owners are Shanghai Auto. And in the case of East Hope, it's the state owners that have a joint venture with the East Hope Group. Then there's the next tier in the hierarchy are the private owners that have equity ties with the state-owned firms. That's East Hope the, and then the owners of... Uh, Anbang, VW, and GM. So these are the owners that we are gonna, the, the, the language that we're gonna use is that we're gonna say that these are private owners that are directly tied or directly connected uh, with the state owner. And then there's gonna be this next tier, which is the private owners in, 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 the, di in the table I gave you, the uh, private owners that don't have an equity tie with the state owner, but they have an equity tie with another private owner that has a tie with the state firm. Okay, so these are the in in in, in these are the private owners that are uh, that are connected to the East Hope Group, um, but they don't directly have 
a joint venture with the state owner. So the language we're going to use is that these are private owners that are indirectly connected to the state owner. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to go beyond these case studies and I'll just show you the evidence systematically for all the companies in China. But let me take a pause here. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a couple of relevant questions. So um, Hao Chen, who um, and from the University of Southern California asks, what does it really mean? Um, what do you mean by a second layer, a third layer, even more layers in joint ventures? And Hao is pretty familiar with this data also. But, but the question is kind of how would, what kind of influence should we interpret from a N layer joint venture with an SOE background? What kind of, how do we know if there's any influence say of an SOE over a firm if, the ownership links are that attenuated? How would you interpret that? I mean, that's partly what I want to, I mean, that's partly what we want to try to figure out with the data, right? That's partly what we want We want to see is when companies get connected at different layers. So let me, let me. I, I guess I shouldn't answer this way. What we mean by layer, uh, uh, the, 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 the language we're going to use is basically, how distant are the ownership links with the state? Uh, with, uh, with with the state. Uh, so if you are, if 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 you are ten layers removed away from the state, well, what we mean is that you you have a joint venture with the company uh, that has a joint that, that that is not directly tied with the state, but in which its closest tie with the state is is is. Uh, is nine layers removed from from uh, from the state? So that's what we. Um, what is the influence of the state? Um, I mean, there's nothing in the data that would that that says anything about it. What 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 we can what we can say with this data is what happens to companies after they become connected. What happens in terms of the growth? What happens in terms of the extent to which they are providing connections to what to other companies? What other companies do they create? Uh, what you know? What is the geographical reach of these companies? So that, that's what we can measure empirically in the data. One of the things that one one I think wants to know, and there's nothing in the data, but I think it's a great question, or uh, if there's a way to do this, is. Um, what happens if somebody high up in the party wants something? Or what, 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 what does the equity link, does the equity share gives the party more leverage? And I, I, I don't have a way of answering that question. Uh, and there's nothing that we say in, in, uh, uh, that, um, that, yeah, so. I, I, I agree that it's it's a great question to, to it's a great question to answer, but we don't answer it here. We just ask what what economically happens to these companies, so to these owners. Uh, Can I then? So there's another question from um, Ying Ching Su, Su Ying Ching, which wants that, and the question is basically related to that. So what do you, what is the behavior difference, right, between the 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 companies, either the ones that get state investment? They get attenuated state investments or don't. So they, so I mean, you can tell, and I guess you're going to show us that they, whether you want to say, you know, I guess infect the rest of the economy is the right metaphor. But are they more profitable? Are those firms do they become larger? And you know, are they more efficient? Can you say anything about basically the economic performance? And I mean, I think the ultimate question is, what is the policy and economic implication of the rise of state connection that you're measuring? Yeah. So I'll get to this in a few slides. But basically, what we see is that there's a clear hierarchy of companies as measured by size that depends on their distance from the state. So roughly the way that what we think is going on is that it's, it's, it's the most powerful and it's the largest uh, private owners that manage to get these direct ties with the state. And then, but for the people, for the people that are smaller than, than that, uh, the, the, the state, Owners don't pay attention to don't they don't pay attention to them and that's why uh, you know you don't see these ties. But then what you see is that they manage to to create these links with other private 
owner. So there's a, I'll show you in I'll show you in the next slide that what uh, in three slides that what you see is that there's a very clear hierarchy in terms of who manages to connect at different layers, uh, at different layers. And there's a very clear hierarchy in terms of size. And there's also a very clear hierarchy in, in terms of who connects at each layer and the kind of, sub, and the kind of, and well, more precisely, it's the number of connections that they themselves can provide to other companies. So state-owned firms provide the most connections then the ones that are directly connected, the private owners that are directly connected, they provide the second largest number of connections. Then the, the next tier provides even less and, and, and so on. So what this seems to suggest that it's, it's a, what, 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 what you do, it's, it's almost like a model. It's, it's like what you would get in a model of, of a, a sort of matching. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and matching at different layers means that you also also get less. Uh, you you you. Uh, um, now the second part of it is what happens to these companies. Well, it you also see the same thing in terms of how their performance changes. You you see the biggest jump in per, in per, in performance among the ones that are do uh, that are directly connected. You see us. Uh, you see a smaller jump among the ones that are further that that are that are connected. At layers that are more distant from, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, that are more uh, distant from the state. Um, um, Just a last question about data before you before we see that from Terry Sicular, who says it's very interesting, and she wants to say just to be clear, do these data cover the entire universe of firms in China, all sizes, all sectors, industry services, etc.? And if not, if there's anything missing, what is it? The only thing that is missing are the the the, the self-employed. That that's the only thing. Uh, they don't have to be uh, registered with the data. But other than that, everybody's here. Uh, yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Other bigger okay. questions for later, but I think we should move on. This is great. Okay. Uh, let me. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is, is that I'm. I'm going to just tell the essentially the same story, uh, the same story, but now I will show you the patterns for all the firms. So I'm, I'm going to go beyond the East Hope and, and the, the Shanghai Auto example. So the first fact is, is that um, it's, it's just the idea that top owners in China are connected. Uh, are connected. So uh, here, here's a simple way to illustrate this. So if you look at the, the top 100 largest owners in China, by which we mean the we look at the owners with the largest amount of registered capital. 63 of them are state owners. 37 of them are private owned. Are, are private owned. So these are the companies that most of you will, will know, right? Uh, uh, or you will know some of these companies. You may not know, you, you, you probably will not know the full dimensions of the owners, uh, of, of all the things that, uh, that uh, the owners own. But of the 63 state owners that are among the top 100, every single one of them is doing this. They're, uh, they, they are connected with somebody. With, 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 uh, in, in, in this case, they're connected with a private, uh, uh, with, with some private owner, and in fact, with multiple private owners. Of the 37 private owners that are in the top 100, 31 of them are directly connected with some state of owner, and three of them are indirectly uh, connected. So this just, um, and then let, let me just, the second column just shows you the same thing, but for the top 100,000 largest uh, uh, owners in China, you have, there are 7,000 of them are state owners and the majority of them are connected. And then 93,000 of them are private and 17,000 are directly connected and 37,000 of them are indirectly connected. So roughly more, uh, roughly more, 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 more than half. So the takeaway from this is that the distinction that a lot of us want to make between uh, be, be, between the private and state, um, at least for the largest owners, the larger firm, it's it's really hard to make that distinction now because they're all closely interconnected. Uh, uh, it, as the the distinction only makes sense when when you when you talk about you know small firms. So when you talk when you talk about small owner, but for the very largest firms, it's not a very useful 
this thing. I mean, so sometimes the way I I, I say I, what what I say, and this is the way I think about China, is that it's all, you know, it's not really public versus private. Is not a useful distinction to make. It's all the shade. It's all the shades of gray, and and then the question is whether it's 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 closer to the black or it's closer to the white. Um, but that's the first take, uh, takeaway. Here's another way to make the same point. Which is let, let me look. Uh, so this is a plot of only of the state owners in 2019, where I'm basically breaking down the state owners by their size, and I basically say what of of state owners in each size per centile, what fraction of them are doing this. And if you look at say state owners that are in the top 10 per centile, about 80 to 90 percent of them are are doing this. So when you look at the largest state. Owners, most of them are doing this, but when you look at the smallest ones, if you look at say the ones that are in the bottom 20 per, in the bottom 20 percentile, that's about two to three percent. So very few of the small state-owned firms are doing this. So this is the, the phenomena that I'm describing is primarily something that you see occurring at the very top of the distribution, okay? Uh, but because it's occurring at the very top of the distribution, it's it, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you in a few minutes that it it accounts for a very large share of economic activity in China. Okay, fact two, which is the hierarchy of private owners, and I'll show you this in two ways. Okay, I'm going to define a term. Uh, I've said a, I've, I've said a little bit about this. In response to a question, I'm going, but I'm going to define just to be clear. I'm going to define a term called distance to the state, which I'm, it's 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 defined as the minimum number of private owners that are that you have to go through uh, between the owner in uh, that uh, be, be, between the owner in question and the state owner. So East Hope Group, okay, is directly connected with the state. Owner, so that is an owner that we are those the Liu family where we are going to say the Liu family distance to the state is distance one. Okay, so uh, you just have to move one step before you get to the state to the state owner. So and um, uh, an owner that's a distance two is basically it's a private company that East Hope has a joint venture with. That is before you get to the state owner, you have to go through the East Hope group. Okay, and what the and and I'm going to show you this. I mean, part of what we were just astounded by uh, when we started to look at this, uh, uh, we started to look at this data, is just the proliferation of owners that are not directly connected, but are indirectly connected with the state owner up until distance ten. Okay, so that's the definition of distance, and what I'm showing you here is basically. The average registered capital of the private owner at each layer, at each distance from the state, uh, relative to the private owner. So this is all relative to the private owners that have no ties to the state. Okay. So owners like the owners of the East Hope Group, that's a distance one, on average, they have a registered capital that's 250 times larger than that of the non-connected private owner. Uh, non-connected private owner, but you can but you what you can see here is that this um, this this gap, right? Uh, so the difference in size drops pretty dramatically. It it drops so by the by a distance two, it's it's a gap, it's a gap, it's it's about twenty five times larger. Distance three, it's about fifteen times uh, larger, and by the time you get to distance ten, they're about three times. Larger than 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 the non-connected firm. Okay, another way in which you see this is by looking at the number of what of uh, I of the number of joint ventures that a typical private owner at each distance is making with private owners that are more distant from them. From the state, so think of this as being downward investments, if if you will. Okay, so what we're measuring here is basically, in the case of the East Hope Group, is basically how many investments do they have with other private owners. So, and then a, a company like the East Hope Group, on average, they have three joint ventures with companies that are smaller than than that that are that are uh, that are. Uh, 
uh, and when you get to distance two, that's that number is uh, the they uh, on average they have about two, and when you, by the time you get to distance five, on average they're only making five. They're only making the, uh, the 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 owners at distance five. They're only making one in the only making one investment. Okay, this is going to be a very important number in determining how the system propagates. Okay, so let me just go back again. Um, go back to the COVID lead, the the COVID lead. COVID literature, I, I don't know how many of you have followed the technical literature, people, I mean, the key variable in an epidemic is this thing that, e, that, 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 that the public health experts call r not, which is the reproduction rate. It's that, and it's the reproduction rate is the key variable that, de, that determines how the pandemic spreads, right? Think of this as being essentially the same thing, okay? Essentially the same thing, and and it's it's really it's really the same thing that it, if R naught is greater than one, then the then the pandemic spreads to the entire population. If R naught is less than one, then eventually the pandemic dies. Think about this as being essentially the same thing. It's basically once you get in once you get infected in this case infected with the state, then how many other people do you pass this on to? And if that number is always greater than one, what eventually happens is that you you basically pass you you uh, that you basically pass this virus off. You pass this virus to every firm in the economy. If this if this ver if this number is less than one, eventually it dies off. That is, it's 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 um, and what you can see is that you know at some point at distance five it gets below one, and it, uh, below one so then. And so then, so then, eventually, the fraction of owners that are connected in some way with the state uh, um, stops. That is, it doesn't propagate to the to the to the to the entire economy. And the other part that's going to be important, which which I will uh, show you next, is that the equivalent of this R not uh, variable. It's the key is one key variable that has. That has increased in the last 20 years. It's almost as if what, what's happened in the last 20 years is that the effective reproduction rate of this virus has gone up. And this is a big part of what, what, what it, you know, in some sense, has led to the expansion of the size of the connected sector. Okay. So I'll show you that in a minute, but but the, the, but the, the, this is just shows you that you see the hierarchy in terms of the size of of the owners, and then also in terms of how each owner reproduces herself to the next group of firms. Um, fact three. Uh, this goes to a question. Um, this is just a plot of. The share of the equity of the connected investor in the businesses of the of of the doubt of, of 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 the firm. So, a typical owner at distance one from the state, the state has about a twenty percent a twenty per a twenty percent share in the equity of the businesses of the owner. Uh, for example, let me just bring you back to the case of 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 a cherry. Uh, Shanghai Auto's equity stake in Cherry was 20%. And what this says is that that is a very typical number. Okay, The number goes up uh, when you uh, once you get to distance two, but it typically is around 40%. In rare cases, do we see that number going above, uh, go, uh, going above uh, 50%. Um, so I, I guess what, what, what this, you know, one question uh, that, that 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 you might have is whether uh, state owners are, are are whether state owners are the controlling shareholders of of these companies, and it looks like in the vast majority of cases it's not. Uh, it, it, they're they're not the, they're they're not the, the controlling shareholder. Let me just say that it it doesn't look any different when if you want to think about their their control right instead of their share of the equity. 
That is, it's not the case, at least for the state owners, it, it's not the case that they're owning, that the state owner owns 50% of a holding shell and that holding shell owns 50% of another holding shell. And there are 10 other holding shells so that with an equity share of what, you know, uh, 0.5 to the power of 10 to, uh, it, it, that is, imagine this chain where like, if you have, only enough money to own 5% of a company, but you still want to have uh, to have the c- control rights over the company. One way in which you could do it is to structure it through this through these layers of uh, ownership. At least for the state owners, that doesn't seem to be what it's doing. That is the share. Uh, I know we're saying this is that state owners don't seem to do, to to be using this the this network this layer of a holding shelves it's the private owners that are uh, that 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 seem to be doing this um fact four the other thing that you see is that we, over the last 20 years the number of connected owners has increased by quite a bit over time so what what this plot is it's it's a cross section of in three years uh so this it's maybe an answer to uh, to Meg's uh, 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 question at the beginning. It's a cross section in 2000, 2010, and 2019 of the number of connected owners by distance from the state. Okay, so for example, if you want to know uh, how many owners were directly connected to the state in 2000, that's given by this number here, which is about 20,000. And by 2019, that number had increased by a factor of five. So it's now, by 2019, that number is 100,000, okay? But the other thing that you see here is that the big expansion is in terms of the owners that are, that are distantly related to the state. That is, in 2000, there were basically, uh, they, 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 there were very few owners that were distantly connected to the state, but by 2019, that number had just uh, gone up by, had just gone up by quite, uh, by, uh, so by quite a bit. So what, but what this says is that the big expansion is really in the companies that are indirectly connected to the state. Uh, and then you are going to miss if if your focus is only on the companies that in which the state has has an equity share in, then you're going to miss out what I think is is a big uh, is a big part of the action. Um, let me just say a simple way to decompose this to, to think about the, the 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 forces that could be that could be behind this. First, just focus on the increase in the number of 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 owners that are directly connected to the state. That's gonna be a product of two things. It's gonna be a product of, of how many state firms are doing this and conditional state firms uh, doing this, uh, how intensively are they doing this? So here's a plot of the share of state owners with joint ventures with private uh, with uh, private uh, owners and that number goes up from, from about 3% to 25%. By uh, by uh, by uh, 2019, this is a plot of what you see changing on the intensive margin that is conditional on having joint uh, joint ventures. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to be clear. Again, this is focused on state owners. Uh, we're um, uh, on average they are making three uh, three um, in three in three investments at the beginning of this period. But by 2019, that number had gone out to more than 15. So obviously, the product of these two things is just is going to be the the increase in the number of owners that are directly connected to the state. Okay, but that's not the only thing that is going on. The other thing that is going on is basically there's you also see the increase in what I in what, what 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 I call the the effective reproduction rate. So this is basically looking only at the private owners and basically uh, asking how many investments are private owners at each layer, at each, uh, each, at each, uh, uh, um, at each uh, uh, distance from the state. How many investments are they making with other companies? And that number, say, companies that were directly connected to the state in 2000, they were making on average one. 
okay? But by 2019, that number was 3.5. So now think about just, just in, in terms of the basic math, how many firms, how many owners are you gonna have in layer two? Well, there are two things that are happening, right? State owners are doing this, so there's an increase in the number of private owners that are directly connected to the state. Now, condition on being directly connected to the state, that the typical firm was making one was making one investment uh, in 2000, but now by 2019, the number has gone up to 3.5. So the increase in the number of owners that are at distance to from the state, it's 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 going to be the product of two numbers. It's a product. It, it's 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 a product of the fivefold increase in number of owners that are directly connected to the state, and the increase from one to three point five in terms of the reproduction rate of the private owners that are directly uh, that are uh, uh, that are uh, 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 that are directly connected to the state. Okay, somebody asked this, our fact five is about what happens to the private owners after they become connected with the state. And here, what I'm gonna just show you, the, so this is just a plot of what you get from a standard event study uh, on, you know, and the event is just being connected with, is, is getting a connected investor. And this is the increase in the number of investments. So. The, the dashed line is the pre-trend, and then the, the red line is, is what you see in the data. So there's an increase in the number. So there's a break in the trend in terms of the number of investments that they make. There's a break in the trend in terms of the number of provinces that, that an owner operates in. And there's also a break in the trend in terms of the number of industries that the owner's firms are operating after they get uh, connected. Let me take a pause here before I go to the last fact, because I know I've gone on for a long time. Well, that's great. And there are some really good questions, actually. So um, I do want to ask them. So let me try to pose a couple of them together. So one is, um, can you tell who's, I guess, can you tell who's making money from all of this, right? So do you have any visibility, Jeff Williams asked, into the flow of dividends upward through the networks? Um, and a related question is kind of, um, which someone had early on, which is this kind of connected business dealing seems to carve out market opportunities for select groups who then reap these massive gains for their own cohorts. And so do you think it exacerbates income and wealth inequality? And is it viewed, is this viewed as a social problem in China or is this just business as usual? So what are the kind of welfare effects um, of, of this? Yeah. Um. This is a great question about the flow of dividends. I don't, I don't observe that. I mean, I, I mean that, that 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 that's not in. I mean that that's not in the data. Um, I can say something from a, just a couple of case studies. So we have looked in maybe about fifty companies. We've looked in detail at about fifty companies or fifty owners that have done this. Um, and I guess in I guess the majority of the cases, what you see is that both parties are benefiting from doing this. I, I would say that both I mean both parties are uh, I mean the 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 connected investor is benefiting because uh, you know they have a 20, 30, 40 percent share of the business. So uh, so they so that's their share of the profits of the company. Even if the company is not delivering dividends, you know th there's still the value of the company after the company is growing. Um, and I would say that in the cases that we've looked at, there's perhaps more resentment on the recipient side. That that uh, that is. They do this because it's necessary, but in, in a couple of cases, we, you know, they do express some resentment that that they have to do this in order to grow. Uh, that, uh, uh, um, um, but the fact is that they do. I mean, in in the in at least in the number of cases that we have looked at, they do seem they do seem to do well. Um, what are the social consequences of this? I 
I mean, I guess I'm of two minds about this, that I, I mean, on the one hand, it's, it's a way, it, it's a way so the, the one way which you can think about it is is that think about what or what we would typically say if we, if we see a system where you have a group of politicians with a tremendous amount of pol, with a tremendous amount of political power over what the businesses do and what um And the way that we would typically, I, I would say that if you say our typical response is that, well, what we should do is that we should level the playing field and we should remove the power that Paul, that we should, we should remove the power that Paul politicians have over what uh, businesses do and, and, and create a level playing field. Um, the way I think about what's happened in, in what's happened in China is, is that it's not the the route that they've taken is is not that, but they have basically take uh, that what through these two mechanisms that I, first the mechanism in terms of what local governments are doing, and now through this uh, uh, through through the mechanism that 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 I'm uh, describing here is that they're basically marketizing their political power. I mean, there you you have powerful people that are that that are basically selling. They're they're selling their their uh, access. So, and then I guess the other thing that I we the, that we I think is important is is that once you that after they sell their political power and then other people then uh, then that then become wealthy and then part of what you get from being wealthy is that you also have some power and access of your own. Then they then start. And do the same thing themselves. So then, what that does is that it 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 basically spreads that power uh, uh, among more and more people. So I just want to just bring you back here. Uh, I'm going to bring you back to this graph here, which is just um, so I, I'll just remind you of, of two graphs. Think about the owner that's a distance ten from the state. They're not that big. They're only three to four times larger than the unconnected firm. Okay, so these are not. I mean, you know, by no means would you say that these are powerful, large, wealthy owners. But what what you have is that these guys also do have something, right? And the other part of what you see, I'll just come back to this piece of uh, to this piece of uh, evidence. It's just, it's just the other thing of what you see is that. You you see lots of these guys emerging, lots of uh, of of owners that are are distance ten from the state. They're not that big, but they go from basically zero to two hundred thousand uh, by by uh, two thousand nine. So it's almost like so I uh, so this is a long long winded answer, but I, because I think what what you see happening is that it's what you see is that this is a system that is that is uh providing market opportunities to more and more people but it is also true of course that that there are people that are left out right uh, uh, which are which which are the owners that are that we, which are the owners that are not connected um, we only have a few more minutes but I want to ask this one question because I think it's a really good one and then you can move on to your last fact so Charlie Wong says, um, is there an equivalent model that exists in Western systems, such as connected venture capital, private equity, or corporate investors, and how would this compare to China's connected investor model you presented? I, let me bring you back to the news from six months ago or, or seven months ago about when the Trump administration announced the, the TikTok deal. Uh, do, do, do you remember the, which is now long, no longer operative? What struck me, uh, what struck me about that deal is that it was very much like this kind of a deal. You think we, we, we remember that deal? That basically, TikTok was was a sell itself. It could survive in the U.S. if it got if it if it sold itself to connected investors, 
U.S. connected in, investors. In, in, in the case of the TikTok deal, it was it was Walmart plus somebody else, right? Uh, Microsoft, uh, yeah. Microsoft. Yeah, no, uh, it, it was, uh, that, uh, um, um, uh, and then. But I would say, I, I, yeah, I, I can't think of it. I can't, um, maybe for venture capital, it's the same thing that basically if, if you want to go, if you want to grow, then you, that, that you basically get uh, some, you, you get an influential venture capital firm on board. And that's a way to signal what, to signal what your, to signal what your type is. Uh, so I, I think that there's I think that there's some of this going on in many places. I would say that the difference is just the just the scale and the magnitude in which it's occurring in China is not something that I have seen I I, I have seen a I've seen anywhere else. Um, uh, uh, I mean, certainly the notion of 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 a connected investor is some is is something that is well known here. Uh, as well over here, but just, but 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 just not, not at the scale with, with, with which I see that it's taking place in China. Um, let, let, let me just show you my, my last fact, which is uh, so I, I've shown you two facts, which, which is that there's an expansion in uh, there's an increase in the number of owners that are connected, uh, that are connected, and then the connected owners grow. The product of these two things is just going to be the share of the connected owners in the economy, and that's what this table is. So this is the the, the registered capital share of different types of owners. So the first fact I've already shown you, which is the the increase in the registered capital share of the private owners, that number is fifteen per is uh, is a fifteen percent. But what I'm showing, what 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 the, the table is showing in the next two columns is basically how much of that is coming from the private owners that are connected. So if you add up the directly connected and the indirectly connected owners, their share over this period goes up by 16%. So so basically all of the increase in the private sector, the share of registered capital of the private sector is coming from the is coming from the connected sector. And the other part is that the connected state owners, they themselves shrink relative. So just, just to be clear, it's not as if they're, they are shrinking in absolute terms, they're growing, but they're shrinking in relative terms. That is the, the owners whose growth they've enabled is just much larger. The, 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 these owners grow much more than the state, the state owners that are at, that are at the top of this chain, if, if, uh, if, if you will. So let me just take 30 more seconds and just summarize what, what, what I think that this is saying. That I think that what we're saying is what, what, what we're seeing is that what, what's happened in the last 20 years is that it's become easier to scale the connections of the connected owners. So the, the consequence of this is that you see an increase uh, in the number of, of owners that are connected and you see an increase in their size. That is, you know, uh, um, so what this is is that it's it's I think the broader story is that it's 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 an expansion of the special deals regime in the sense that you no longer no longer need to have direct access to a local part to uh, to a local party boss you need uh, you need access to a connected investor and what a connected investor does is that she scales her power her advantages on your behalf right uh, so that's what I think we are seeing but it does raise questions that we don't uh, that uh, I think would be lovely to answer is what does it mean when you have an economy where you where where you have such a large chunk of the of 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 the of of the large and successful private owners that depend critically on this power in order to uh, uh, they depend on this power in order to uh, 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 in order to operate. Um, if I were a political scientist, that that's what I would be thinking about. Uh, 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 so anyway, I'll stop here. But I, I'd love to take more questions if, if there's time. Uh, well, I want to respect everyone's time. So technically, we only go until five thirty. Um, but I think, I mean, if you're willing to hang out for just another few minutes and answer a couple more questions, um, sure. and then I'll I'll just pose a couple at the same time. 
Um, I mean, sure, I take I take the bait as a political scientist. Yeah, we, I have to answer this question. You're going <laughs> to show me the big data part of it and measure it. And then we have to answer it. I have ideas, but I'll leave myself out of it. Um, so a couple of good questions. So one is this question about where, whether this is, um, and I guess it's like a, a question about whether, what are the effects of this? So um, Austin Jordan asks, is this, you know, do we find connected investors picking firms that are already on an upward trajectory? Or is it about basically firms are all equal and then they do better once they attract government performance? And you can see how that would have different kind of macro outcomes. Cause like, is this about a state that's picking effective winners and investing in those winners and enabling them more, or is it about, you know, rent seeking, et cetera. And then the other question and the last question, and then we'll, we'll, we'll say goodbye. Um, as another graduate student, Saul Wilson asked, is this, you know, when you talk about formalization of something that's informal, is it a formalization he asked of the Zhao Shang Yinzi, Yinzi, sorry, or like you're attracting investment basically, or is it a formalization of Dai Hong Mao Zhe, of, of private firms that are trying to pretend to, to seek cover through state connection basically? Um, I think you'll probably understand the distinction there. Let me just take the first question and let me just go back to some to these slides. So the answer is that it's, it's a, so if you stare at this, right, what, what you see, if you stare at, at these three slides, this one, this one, and the, this one, what you see in all cases is that there is a pre-trend, right? There is, there is a pre-trend. So it's not the case that, that the connected investors are picking random. That they're picking, uh, they're picking firms that are growing, right? They're, 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 it's, it's clear, it's clear in, in, in uh, that, that they're, they're picking firms that are growing. But what you also see is, is that after they become connected, there is, I think, a statistically significant evidence that the growth trajectory changes. Uh, so, uh, um, Yeah, I mean that's, uh, and I guess I, it it would be surprising if you don't see a pretrend, like if 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 because the way that you want, I the way I have to think about it is that you only have limited ability to do this if you are a polit if you are a politically connected person, a politically connected individual. So you want to pick the ones. So it's to think of these guys as being doing what a venture capital will do. That is, it's I mean. The craziest thing to do would be to to randomly pick. Uh, you, you are not going to rand randomly pick. You are going to pick the ones that you think are are going to benefit the most from what you can uh, from what uh, you can uh, provide. I think you are seeing that here. Uh, um, and but that also makes it difficult to answer the question: What is your value added? I mean, it's like you know, it's the question. You know, I wish we could answer this question in the academic community because you know what we do all the, the, the essence of what we do is that is that we pick, uh, we we pick, and then what is the value that we add? I think it's a very tough question to answer. Uh, um, how do I want to think conceptually about what these companies are doing? I don't think what they're doing is, is that they are putting on a red hat. I just, you don't, I, I don't see them. Pre, I don't see them pre. I don't see them pretending that they're state-owned firms. I, what I see them doing, at least in, in the, the cases that I have looked at, they're basically relying on on their connected investors to do favors for them. So there's something that they need, and they call upon this the the, the investor, and then they be, and it's and the, this person or this company, um, you know, benefits from the success of the company. But but I don't see them pretending to be stayed on firm. So I, I don't think that that's it. You know, so I don't think it's the phenomena from the 1980s. Uh, but again, you know, I have a sample size of 50 and, you, you know, there's uh, several million here. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that one can find other case studies in which, in which they are putting on a red hat. Well, um, it's very provocative work. I wish I had your data. It's amazing to see some of these trends that some of us have feel like we've been observing kind of anecdotally um, formalized in this way. So um, so it's great work. I mean, we all have a lot of work to do to figure out what the implications of this are. But um, but let me just thank you for your time. It's a great presentation. And, um, and thanks to all of you for attending and your questions. Um, and I'm sure Professor Shea would appreciate feedback um, in written form since we don't have time, but um, he's a very open person. So thank you. Thanks, Meg. This was fun. Thanks again. Great.